Hey, good evening, Coast Hills. How are we doing? A little bit different tonight. Um, you can see that uh, I'm at my house. We're not at the church. And we're going to go straight into the study. Uh, I want to make a couple of announcements for you. Um, we're glad that you're joining us online. Um, and we've got something for our Student Life program. So at 7 o'clock, if you connect to either our Student Life Instagram pages or you can click on the resource tab, 7 o'clock, students can join. Um, we've got an opportunity there for you at 7 o'clock. As well, um, at the end, we're going to be able to go into our life groups and either you're going to have your own Zoom room or um, maybe you would like to connect on to one of our Zooms. We've got that available for you as well. So we'll make sure that you get connected with that. Welcome to my home. Um, a little bit different, but hey, everything's a little bit different these days. So we are uh, going to be meeting on Wednesday nights from my home and uh, that will just alleviate another a time for the worship team to get together, uh, and, but also provide the opportunity to um, get together with you online. So, so thankful that uh, you've joined us. We're gonna go straight into the Word in Matthew's Gospel chapter five, but before we do that, let's pray. Father, I'm just so thankful for Coast Hills Church and so grateful for the chance that we have to be together even though it's a little bit different, even though it's not quite the same, uh, your people long for fellowship and we long to be together. And so that's just the spirit in us and he longs to be with other Christians. It's just who he is and he's in us. And so I pray that even though technology is fulfilling some of the need, that you would open up the door for us to be able to be together again safely and securely. Lord, as the shepherd of Coast Hills, it's my heart's desire to gather, but it's also my heart's desire to protect. And so I pray that uh, with these moments over uh, on a live stream in my home, that there would be a sense and a feel that we are together, uh, especially as we connect in the word. So thank you, Jesus, for our time. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We have been studying uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, and it's uh, great to be in this text because we call it the Constitution of the New Kingdom. Um, and <laughs> I want to let you know, I'm actually filming on my phone, so all of you guys that are texting me right now, I can see your names coming across my screen every five seconds. So hello to everybody. Uh, so glad that you guys are with us. Um, but we're in Matthew, chapter 5. It's a Constitution of the New Kingdom. And Jesus is talking about what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom. And we've been walking through the rights that we have. First, he talked about the character of those in the kingdom. And those were the be attitudes, the attitudes to be, as we've said before. Uh, we talked about the fact that they're different and that we've got to be salt and we've got to be light. Uh, and we then walked into exceeding righteousness and the bill of rights for a Christian and the rights that Jesus has afforded us because of his blood on the cross. And we've been going through the bill of rights and now we find ourselves on the sixth bill of right. And I want you to write it down in your notes. As citizens of the kingdom, because of the blood of Christ, we have the right to respond. We have the right to respond, which exceeds retaliation. Let's pick it up. It's Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to be reading from verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, don't resist the one who's evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. All right, what in the world is Jesus talking about in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5? Let me explain. It comes all the way from the book of Exodus, chapter 21, verse 24. Exodus 21, 24. Now, it's, it's repeated in Leviticus. It's also repeated in Deuteronomy. But he's talking about the Jewish law, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, this law was given to the magistrates, to the judges, so that they would be able to judge a case fairly. So if someone stole a book, you didn't demand two books. It was an eye for an eye 
and it was a tooth for a tooth. So whatever someone took from you, you had the opportunity to get that back from them. But in the case of an eye, if it, uh, what, what this particular text is talking about, or in the case of a tooth or a foot, you could pay what was fair for um, some, uh, something that you lost even on the, as a part of your body. It was to be fair and it was to be equitable. However, as typical as the Jewish culture is arguing over what exactly does this mean, the Jews began to twist the meaning, not for fairness and equity, they began to twist it to revenge and retaliation. In other words, even God said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and they would take revenge or find vengeance, or they retaliate against someone who did something about them. Now, the truth of life is someone's going to do something sometime in your life to hurt you. That's just a reality. Uh, Jesus even said in Luke chapter 17, you can look it up later, Luke 17 verse 1, he warned that offenses are going to come. That's a reality of life. People are going to offend you. People are going to hurt you. But in that same verse, Luke 17, 1, Jesus gives another truth of citizens of the kingdom. Just don't be the one that causes the offense. And so before we go into our right to respond and how we should respond, I want to take a moment to back up a little bit and establish three citizen principles in regards to how we are to respond. So that's going to be three principles in regard to how we're going to respond. So the first one, you can write it down, as a citizen of the kingdom, don't be the evil person. I'm going to say it one more time. As a citizen of the kingdom, don't be the evil person. Jesus said, listen, offenses are going to come. Just don't be the one that brings the offense. Um, and so let's talk about evil for just a second. I'm going to take you to Romans chapter 1. Turn there with me. Romans chapter 1. And I'm going to read a text for you because Paul outlines evil. Now, this, this list is not exhausting. We've got another list in 1 Corinthians 6. We've got another list in Revelation. Um, and so this is just one of a list of sins that the Bible says are evil. Listen to this. It's Romans 1. I'm going to pick it up in verse 29. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, of envy, murder. Uh, excuse me, I'm going to pick it up in verse 29. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil. So he calls this evil, covetous, uh, covetousness and malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, Foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree, those that, uh, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. So what Paul does is he says, let me outline what evil looks like. He says they're gossips, they're slanderers, they're, they're uh, malicious, deceitful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. And he makes this list. Now, remember what I said. This list is not necessarily exhaustive. And one of the things you want to do with this list is take a look at it. Um, you want to be careful that none of these things are in your life. Because if these things are in your life, you've got the righteous Holy Spirit kind of adjoining and abiding with evil things. And so you don't want to have that as a part of the connection, the going on, this internal war that's going on inside you. So the first part is to take a look at these things and go, hey, and for me, I might ask a good friend of mine, go through this list and say, hey, do you see any things of these things in me? Um, I will definitely ask the Holy Spirit of God. The Bible says in the book of Psalms that we should ask the Spirit to search us and to know us and expose anything in us that isn't right with God. Because let me tell you about evil. Evil is one letter short of the devil, all right? It is representation of him, and none of us want to be like the devil. None of us, that would be foolish for us to be the devil or to be like the devil, to have any qualities that are his characteristics. It would be absolutely foolish. In fact, that's exactly what the Bible calls evil. Um, turn your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 4. Now, gang, we're going to be in a few areas of Scripture, so you want to maybe stretch your fingers a little bit, okay? Jeremiah, and I'm sitting down, so I might preach for an hour. So Jeremiah chapter 4, take a look at verse 22. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 22. 
Do you not fear me, declares the Lord? Do you not tremble before me? Excuse me, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 22. I'm reading chapter 5. For my people are foolish. They know me not. They are stupid children. They have no understanding. They are wise. I know, God used a potty word. They are wise in doing evil. But how to do good, they know not. Listen, what, listen this is God speak. He says, my people are foolish because they're wise in doing evil. You see, the fool and evil are kind of interchangeable words. Listen to what the psalmist wrote. It's Psalm chapter 14. I'm going to read it for you. Psalm chapter 14, verse 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. Now, this word is the word evil. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. The fool does evil deeds. Once again, the Bible proving that evil and foolish go hand in hand. In fact, you can write it down and look it up later. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 23. The evil, um, uh, it's, it's, evil is sport to a fool. That's what the Bible says. New King James Version. Evil is sport to a fool. They just love to do it. They love to play with it. They love to be a part of it. So don't be foolish. And as a citizen of heaven, don't be the evil person because that would be foolish. That leads us to number two. I want you to write down. As a citizen, don't answer a fool according to their folly. Listen again. It's Proverbs 26, verse 4. Don't answer a fool according to their folly. We know we don't want to be evil because evil is foolish. Well, we also know as citizens of the kingdom that we don't want to answer a fool, someone who's evil, according to their folly. We don't want to do it their ways. That's exactly what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 5. This whole teaching is about a proper response, a righteous response to an offense as compared to an irrational reaction. Let me explain that again. This whole teaching that Jesus is communicating is about having a righteous response to an offense as compared to have an irrational reaction. Now remember what Jesus said, it's a promise, it's the will of God, Luke 17. Jesus spoke it, it's gonna happen. Offenses are going to come. But every reaction, if we react, is gonna have another reaction. And if someone doesn't stop the reaction, it's gonna to lead to a war. But a response, a response receives an offense. It receives the reaction and knows how to handle it in order to gain victory. One more time, I'm gonna say it again. The difference between the reaction and the response, a reaction leads to another reaction, that's a law of physics, and it's gonna to lead to a war, a greater reaction. But a response will receive an offense, know how to handle it, so that it can be led to victory. Let me give you an example. My son, uh, he is teaching me how to play lacrosse. Never played lacrosse, and he's learning how to play lacrosse, so I wanna learn how to play lacrosse. And we've been throwing in the back, we've got a lot of time, we've done it a couple times, and he has very graciously not laughed at me as I'm learning the process. Well, he said, Dad, you're holding your stick wrong. Okay, I'm gonna hold it like this. Dad, you're catching it wrong. Well, explain that to me, what do you mean? He goes, Dad, you've gotta receive the ball. You can't just catch it. And I go, well, what does that mean? He goes, well, when the ball's coming to you, you've gotta kinda of like, take your racket and receive it, like just kind of receive it and then start handling it so that you can throw it to me properly. But if you just stand there like this, the ball's gonna hit the net and bounce right off and he was absolutely right. If I just stood there and received the reaction, the reaction of my net was just to bounce it back off. But when I received it, I responded to the ball I was able to catch it every single time and then I knew how to handle it so that I could throw it and it was victory. I was able to throw it to right to Timon and he was able to, well, most of the time I was able to throw it to Timon and he was able to catch it. Gang, a citizen doesn't answer a fool according to his folly. If there's a reaction of anger, the citizen of heaven doesn't react with anger, receives the anger handles it and knows how to throw it to lead to victory. Very important principle. 
Thirdly, I want you to write it down. Remember I said there were three principles. The first was, as a citizen, don't be an evil person. Secondly, as a citizen, don't answer a fool according to their folly. We've got to know how to respond, which exceeds retaliating. Thirdly, write it down. As a citizen, our life is hidden with Christ. Let me explain. When Paul was writing that to the church of Colossae, that our life is hidden with Christ, what he's saying is this. You shouldn't see any of us or the way that we handle things. It should be hidden. It's hidden in Christ. What you should see is Christ in us. What you should see is that we handle things the way that Christ would handle that. Let me say, explain that again. I'm going to say the principle. As a citizen, our life is hidden with Christ. The only thing that you should see, because we're hidden away, is the way what Christ would say and what Christ would do. That's a life that's hidden with Christ. Let me explain it like this. Paul in Galatians chapter 2, he says this, I've been crucified with Christ. And then surprisingly, he goes, nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. And so he gave his life for me and I'm given my life. I'm hiding my life away in Christ so that I'm crucified with Christ. Listen to the terminology. I have been crucified. So I'm dead. I have been crucified. He says in, uh, again in Romans chapter 6, verse 4, that we've been buried with Christ, raised to walk in the newness of life. Listen again to the dead kind of talk. First, I'm crucified. And Romans 6, I've been buried with Christ in order to be raised to walk in the newness of life. This is exactly what Jesus was talking about. It's the death of self. Self is to be dead. Now, let me tell you about dead things. And let me tell you about dead people, okay? Dead people don't feel anything. That's just the truth of dead people. You lift up the arm, it's going to drop. You put a pin in, it's going to... And that's what, why they pierced Jesus' side on Good Friday. They were seeing if there was going to be any bodily reaction to the piercing of his side. They were making sure that he was dead because dead doesn't feel. Dead? Dead doesn't own. We talked about this, right, at Easter. Um, you might think you own something, but whatever you think you own, the bank owns. And if you think you own it, well, whatever the bank doesn't own, the kids own the rest. And then you may even still think you own it, but you still can't take it with you because dead doesn't own anything. It doesn't own anything. Now remember the terminology, crucified and buried. And the other thing about dead, dead's rights aren't violated because there are no rights. The person is dead. And you can't violate the right of someone who's dead. Now, let's go back to the terminology. I've been crucified with Christ. We've been buried with Christ in baptism. And so for the disciple now, who is to die to self, to pick up the cross, to die to self, to the disciple, when we get slapped, when we get sued, and when we get forced... Do we want to slap back? You know, I've always said there's a three-strike rule because Jesus, I, I'm a, I would have been a great Jew. Um, to me, there's a three-strike rule. Um, they can strike you once, then you turn the other cheek, cheek and they can strike you again, but Jesus never said anything about the third strike. So just kind of prompt them to hit you again and then all rules are off, right? Well, no, that's not the truth. But the idea is we want to slap back when we get slapped. Um, sue, look, you're gonna sue me, I'm gonna sue you back. <laughs> You're going to force me? Well, listen, don't force me to do anything. If you force me, I'm going to shove back. And here's what it becomes for the disciple. The disciple who's crucified, the disciple who is buried with Christ, raised to walk in the newness of life. For the disciple, it becomes an eye-opener. It becomes an eye-opener that there are possibly things about us that are not dead. We've been offended. We've been slapped. We've been sued. We've been forced and it begins to bother and anger. And now we want to respond in the same way that the foolish person is responding. Well, we can't forget our second principle that we shouldn't answer a fool according to their folly. And what it does for me, it helps me to see as a disciple, there's probably some things about this dead man that I've not surrendered 
to die. And so these three principles become really important because now we're going to go into our text to understand with these three principles as a backdrop. Let's take a look at the text going back to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, we're going to pick it up there in the middle of verse 39. Do not resist the one who is evil. Once again, do not resist the one who is evil. All right, gang. This is a rough one. I, I hear you loud and clear. I know exactly what you're thinking because I was thinking the same thing. And I've thought the same thing since I've been teaching and even knowing the Sermon on the Mount. Don't resist an evil one. And I don't know if you've noticed something. These rights have been getting a little harder and harder of what Christ has afforded us because of, the, because of his blood, his burial, and resurrection. I mean, we first started out with don't be angry. All right, got that one. Don't be angry. But we've gotten to not just don't be angry, don't resist an evil person. So not only am I not supposed to get angry, am I not supposed to do anything in regards to someone doing something to me? We got to go back to what these are. That's why I'm calling them our rights. This is what Christ has afforded us as we choose to choose to be crucified with him, buried with him, raised to walk in the newness of life. This is the opportunity. This is the right that he's given us that we can respond when we're offended instead of retaliate when we're offended. He said, do not resist an evil person. Now, maybe you want to circle that word resist. It means don't stand against, stand against. That's what he's saying. Don't stand against an evil person. And I want to give you a good example of someone in the Old Testament that did this well, King David. Let's take a look at this guy's life. And I'm so thankful that he went through what he went through. I'm really sad for him. Uh, but I love the Psalms that came out of it that comfort me when he needed to be comforted, he wrote these Psalms, and then I get to read them when I need to be comforted. So while I'm sad for him that these things happen in his life, I'm grateful for scripture that when we're comforted, comforted, we can comfort others. King David, let's get to his life. He was falsely accused by Saul. He was a good guy. He was a righteous guy. He didn't do anything. And Saul built up this whole story, falsely accused him. Secondly, the entire nation of Israel is against him. So here's the guy who killed the 10,000s, and because Saul created a story that wasn't true, now the entire nation is against him. This is going to be the king, their king, okay? And they're against him. Thirdly, his own men revolted against him. Uh, the Bible says when they did, he strengthened himself in the Lord. What a lonely moment that must have been. And he chose to strengthen himself in the Lord. And finally, even when his own son came against him, he's leaving Jerusalem. There is a guy that's throwing rocks at him. His name is Shimei. And he's throwing rocks and he's throwing rocks. And his commander wants to just get him and kill him. And David says, no, don't do it. These rocks might be from the Lord. They could be from the Lord. I love David's perspective. He's not going to answer a fool according to their folly. He's not going to be evil himself. And his life is hidden with God. I'm going to live a godly life despite what other people choose to do. That's my right. That's my responsibility. And it's also important for us to remember what David said. David said, this could be from the Lord. Now, gang, I need you to take a deep breath for what we're about to walk into because I know exactly what you're thinking. Once again, I'm thinking the same thing. Wow. God, if you're in control and I really trust you and I really believe that you have my best interest at heart, are you allowing the attack on my person? Are you allowing the attack on my property? Are you allowing the tack on my privileges? I mean, I believe you're in control when I'm worshiping you and everything's going great. Do I believe that you're in control even when I'm being attacked? I want us to take a look at this. And this is why I ask you to take a deep breath because this one I told you for the kingdom citizen, 
This one might be a little hard to swallow, all right? So let me explain. First, our person. He says this, let me read it for you, for us. But if anyone slaps you, now this if is not in the original, it's whoever slaps you. In other words, this is gonna happen, all right? You're gonna get slapped in your lifetime. He says, but if anyone slaps you or whoever slaps you in the right cheek, turn to him the other also. All right, gang, our person. Getting slapped hurts. I know, in middle school, I got slapped by a girl. I said something that was dumb and I felt the sting of the slap. I was smart enough not to continue because it hurt. And he's saying here, if you've been slapped, just stand there and get slapped again. It's gonna hurt even more. But it's not just a physical pain. I remember when I got slapped. It's not just a physical pain. There's an emotional pain. Sometimes tears come out by force because it hurts so bad. And as a man, you don't want to cry, but it hurts so bad. Um, I had a, a, a migraine yesterday and just could not get out of bed. I sat in bed with tears coming out of my eyes, not because I was crying, it just hurt so bad. Listen, a slap hurts. There's a physical pain, but there's an emotional pain attached to physical pain. There's a mental pain attached to a physical pain. You begin to wonder, why did that happen? And you begin to go through all of these scenarios in your mind and you start to listen to your own self-talk. It could drive you crazy. But there's also a spiritual pain. Because not only are we asking ourselves, why did this happen? We're also asking God. Why did this happen? Yet, there's something I know. We don't question a coach. When a coach gives us a hard practice and he beats our body or she beats our body and we are just exhausted at the end of practice, we might murmur, we might complain, but we know the coach's heart is to make us a better player, is to make us a stronger and more able player. Well, listen to what God says. But may the God of all grace who called us to eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After you've suffered a while, after you've gone through a really rough practice, after you've suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. You see, God quite possibly allows the attack on our person because he's using this situation, he's using the life scenario to actually build our character, to perfect us, to establish us so that things don't bother us as much as it used to, to strengthen us and to settle us, our person. Let's take a look at the next one, our property, our property. Getting sued, okay, so listen to what he says. And if anyone or whoever would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Now keep that in mind. When you get sued, you go in front of a judge. You go in front of a judge. Now here's what happens when you go in front of the judge. You gotta to listen to all the accusations that are against you. And you sit there in that courtroom and you listen to accusation after accusation after accusation that's there in that courtroom. Well, gang, I gotta tell you something. Jesus made it clear earlier in Matthew chapter five that you can do all the Beatitudes. You can be poor in spirit, you can meet, you can mourn, be a peacemaker, and all these incredible, incredible qualities. And the result of the righteous is the very last one. Blessed are you when men persecute you, revile you, and speak and say false accusations against you. It's the result of righteousness. Let me tell you why. You look at a person who's a peacemaker, you look at a person who will cry with you, you look at a person who's humble, poor in spirit, you would never think that you would be mad at a person like that. That's not true. Jesus made it very clear. Men love darkness. Do you remember the evil? They love to slander. They love to gossip. They love to keep something going. It's just what the world loves because men love darkness. They hate light. And because they hate light and you're light, they hate you. That's just the bottom line of our faith. So they'll say whatever it takes to prove their faults case against you. And it amazes me. 
What amazes me is that whatever's in print, people will believe. Whatever's in print, it's almost as if it is the truth. So, sorry, we got a phone going off. Perfect. So, we've, what, whatever is in print is the truth. Let me explain. Andre and I, we raised, uh, we raised a family um, uh, several years ago. We not raised a family. We raised a couple of kids uh, several years ago. And um, they were kids of someone who was well known. And I'll never forget when Andre and I were raising them, there was an article in Newsweek and Time Magazine about this family. Now, they were living in our home, but I'm reading something about this family as if they were doing this family the way that the article was saying they were doing their family, but the children were living in my home. Now, everyone would read that and go, oh, it's gotta be true. But because I knew the truth and I was looking at the article, I was able to say, that's not the reality. Okay. When people say and do all kinds of evil against you, it can be hurtful because it can be hurtful because accusations are hurtful. But accusations can also be beneficial. And let me explain why. Accusations actually give you access into what's going on into someone's heart. You see how the abundance of the heart speaks the mouth. And as a disciple of Christ, I want to know what's going on in someone's heart. I want to know what's going on in someone's mind. And so an accusation allows you to know what's going on inside their heart. But it also allow, accusations also allow something else. They allow us to recognize something that we either said or did that was obviously misunderstood. And so an accusation, if I take it as a disciple of Jesus Christ, it can actually be beneficial instead of hurtful. And the best thing that you can do with an accusation before you go into that courtroom, give them your cloak. Let me explain what that does. You move an accusation to a conversation. Because when you're walking to that judge and you hand over your cloak, say, look, you want my tunic? Take my cloak as well. The person goes, now why did you just do that? Ah, conversation. An accusation moves to conversation which can lead to reconciliation. Gang, besides, let me explain something. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 33, God's the judge. He is the judge. And because he's the, he's the judge, because he knows people's hearts, according to Matthew 12, and he knows people's thoughts, according to Luke 16. That's why John says of Jesus, he's got no need, John chapter two, he's got no need that anyone tell him about man. He knows everything about man. He's able to judge. He's the only judge. And it's amazing to me, we think we have all the information, so we'll make a judgment, but God is the only one that is able to judge the heart. So our job is to live at peace as much as it depends on us. Gang, no matter how they come at our property with accusations in that courtroom, our job is to live at peace as much as it depends on us. Finally, and here's where we close, our privileges. The last thing he says is this, and if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Our privileges. Someone forces us to do something that we don't want to do. Let me explain. Roman law was that if any Roman centurion, any Roman soldier asked you to carry their things for a mile, if you were under the protection of the Romans, by responsibility, you had to carry their things for a mile. That was just the responsibility. So Jesus is looking at the governmental policy and he says this, if they force you to go one mile, I want you to shock them. I want you to surprise them. I want you to go two miles. Now what's your attitude? No one's got the right to tell me what to do. I'm going to revolt. <coughs> I'm going to rebel. I'm going to choose in COVID-19. I'm not going to obey the government. They're against the church. And I'm going to have church because we've got a constitutional right. And that nature of rebel and that nature of revolt. Now, I know there's a season and I know there's a time to stand up for the things that are right. But the heart of a believer... The heart of believer is surrender. The heart of believer is laying down your life. The heart of believer is carrying the cross, 
These are the things that we are supposed to do. Because these are the things that make us look a lot more like Christ at all costs. Now let me tell you something. Sometimes, I know, I know this one's going to be rough. Sometimes you're going to have to force your flesh to go two miles. Because your flesh ain't going to feel it. The spirit is willing, Jesus said, but the flesh is weak. And so when someone forces you to go one mile, we go two because we're going to have to force our flesh to surrender to Jesus. We're going to have to force our flesh to lay down our life. We're going to have to force our flesh to carry our cross. And when we're reviled, not to revile in return. Gang, we have the right to respond. And it just gave us the response. The response that we have, trust God, he's building our character. Trust God and live a life of peace as much as it depends on you. Trust God and force your flesh to surrender to his will. The last verse there in verse 42, we're going to take all of next week just to talk about that verse because in the context of that verse is going to be everything encompassed with the heartbeat of God as to what he wants us to do. And I'm going to give you a hint it's going to be giving something. All right? Gang, thanks for joining us. Let's pray. Lord, I'm so grateful for the time that we've been able to be together online. I ask, Lord, that you would bless the word of God as it goes forth, and I pray that it would go forth in power. Sweet Savior, this one's a hard one because the natural tendency of the human being is to retaliate, not to respond in a godly way. So would you give us the grace to be able to fulfill this? We need it. In Jesus' name, amen.